Okay. So I've been thinking a lot about wellness. You know, what does it mean to be well? Do I need to meditate every day or juice cleanse or go to therapy or a wellness retreat or maybe a wellness therapeutic retreat with a juice cleanse? Do I need to quit my job or just quiet quit it? Maybe I should do Botox or yoga for the stress, but really I should be focusing on the ways the patriarchy has instilled racist, sexist, ageist, ableist, homofat, transphobic, conservative, and liberal conditioning in me, you know? Does anyone else feel stressed out about wellness? <laughs> feel like it's confusing and expensive? So expensive, in fact, that the global health and wellness industry is valued at a cool $0.4 trillion. There are, we're talking about everything from beauty to weight loss and spas and everything in between. There are literally trillions of reasons to keep me confused and busy so that I'll look outside myself to fix the problem. What is the problem really? Well, let's start with the fact that 60% of American adults now are in a perpetual state of burnout. And the research on this is new, but at best, that means we're walking around overwhelmed and exhausted, and at worst, we're anxious, depressed, suicidal. But why are we so burned out? Turns out it's really simple. We have really bad work-life balance. We need to work less and sleep more and see our friends is it that 60% of us are so bad at that? I don't think so, you know. I think most of us have built our lives exactly as we were taught. Wake up, go to school, play a sport or work part-time or both. Come home, eat dinner, do more work, watch TV and go to bed. And we grew up and we upped the stakes, more work, more school, and I don't know, pandemics, racism, I could go on. And there went our friends, our sleep, and brain space for anything at all. Meanwhile, our governments are spending a cool 2% of their health budget on mental health, leaving the treatment of this burnout entirely to the private sector. What does it mean to be well when we don't have time to think about wellness at all and this enormous system benefits so much from us being sick? You know, when I was growing up, we didn't have words like wellness. We just had this word healthy, and being healthy was so easy. You know, all you had to do was eat right and exercise, and I was lucky. I grew up in a home where both parents ate right and exercised. Sure, they worked 14 hours a day, and we moved a lot with the money problems, and they split eventually, but we were a healthy family. When my mom died at 58 from cancer, everybody was confused because she was just so healthy and looked so good. I was 22 at the time. I didn't understand it either, and I couldn't bring her back, but, like, maybe I could be even healthier, you know, and make her proud. If I only lived to be 58 like her, I needed to get to work. I had goals to achieve. And as a historically straight-A student, I got to work uh, researching time management tools. That's the ticket, right? And I found one that promised me peak creative performance. As long as I plan my time in these four categories, work, play, fit, push, I was good to go. And I loved it. I did it every week. In work, I grew my career in public education. I had a side hustle on Airbnb, making lots of money. I bought a condo. I finished grad school. In play, I was out on the town every night with my friends and boyfriends. I was traveling the world on my summers off. In fit, I was working out every day. And in push, I was getting promoted. I even started therapy. I was doing everything my mom never got to do. And I was, as the kids would say, healthy AF. Sure, I was eating a bowl of soup every other day because I didn't have time to make meals and my back kept going out and I was sleeping about three hours a night. But by every societal measure, I was healthy and successful, especially on the outside as a young, thin, white woman trying to do good in the world. And I kept getting rewarded with a little more power and status with every milestone. Then over the course of about 18 months, some 
dominoes started to fall. I had an abortion with a man that I'd been dating off and on for years, and those feelings were pretty complicated, so I just didn't really deal with that or tell anybody. I just went to work the next day. and um, Give me a second. I lost my income on Airbnb when the laws changed, and I lost even more sleep worrying about that new mortgage payment. I went to a music festival in Austin and had a scooter accident, broke my jaw. The very next day, my friend had an even worse scooter accident and almost lost her life. I was buried in shame that somehow my accident had caused hers and I had to, and so guilty because I had to leave her in Austin and go home and get my own surgery to wire my jaw. I made sure that nobody else in my life was impacted and I was back at work within a week supervising 600 students across three school sites all while I was talking like this. I lost 30 pounds in six weeks, surviving on beer and smoothies for calories. And I sought relief starting a new relationship with a very sweet man, but we had to keep it a secret because I was his boss. But then his mother died out of nowhere, and I was thrust back into the trauma of losing my mom and worried about him and responsible for his work performance. Our secret got out and just... Two weeks later, we got word that our colleague had a, an aneurysm in the middle of the night, became brain dead at 42, and I jumped to set up his GoFundMe campaign. I took on all his work responsibilities and I, for months. And then lastly, I got word that my position was being consolidated and I lost my job altogether. I think it's important to note that I saw no correlation with any of this. Now, don't get me wrong, I definitely had no problem beating myself up incessantly for causing it, but I never lost focus on you know, my healthy lifestyle or my peak creative performance. How did I end up here? Burned out, humiliated, numb. I'll never forget that first day without a job because the rain was pounding on my windows and as an educator, you know, when we see rain like that, we viscerally feel how bad that day's about to be. But then I remembered I had nowhere to go and thought, oh yeah, the rain, it's beautiful. I sat there and watched it for hours. It was like I just stopped trying to chase and catch all the raindrops in my life and just let them fall. You know, I'd always kept a journal, which was a practice I learned from my mom. Um, it reminded me of her most peaceful moment, so I just started writing. <laughs> and the more I wrote, the more I saw that I was okay, I'm still here. You know, I wrote about what I was afraid of, but those were just like little paragraphs that didn't really go anywhere. More often, I wrote about how good it felt to have space to think and sleep and even started to dream about what all of this could mean. I'd never sat with myself without a plan before, and in my journal, that felt like possibility versus in my head where it felt like panic. I didn't know at the time, but this was the beginning of my recovery from the ways that all these jobs, degrees, boyfriends, and goals had led me to burn out. You know, the more urgent I felt to achieve, the less sleep I'd get, the more mistakes I'd make, the more money I'd spend on temporary relief, the more I'd push that urgency onto others. However unconsciously I was clinging to that power and status while my world got smaller and smaller. But in my journal, I just kind of started to release the grip. Eventually, instead of just freestyle writing. I borrowed a structure from education and I added some prompts to guide my thinking. Prompts like, what are you proud of? What did you learn? What are you excited about? What would you do differently? And week over week, I taught me about me. What am I proud of about me? I had literally never considered it, <laughs> but I could tell you at length what made others proud. The repetition of answering these prompts every week kept me focused on what I was good at and what inspired me and even got some self-love going on and made me feel excited about what was next. And 
you know, since I had whole days to fill without a job, I harnessed that inspiration and went back to that old time management tool, except I changed the categories. Instead of work, play, fit, push, I changed them to hustle, play, push, move. Hustle felt a little more accurate because I didn't have a job and I could include things like chores and errands and it wasn't so centered on money and I shifted my thinking around play to be a little closer to the way that children experience it and push to be about leaving my comfort zone, which, you know, I was learning how to do, feel more comfortable doing less and that felt better and Move felt better than fit because it wasn't about exercise. It was about mind-body connection and blood flow and brain health. And for the next few months, I watched how my answers to these prompts started to steer my decisions in these categories in the most unpredictable and beautiful ways. I'd name how proud I was picking up a camera for the first time in years and In my hustle, I started to explore photography, even though my career trajectory was education. I'd name how much I learned every time I went out in nature, and my play started to look a lot more like hiking and a lot less like drinking. I'd name how excited I was about the photos I was making. So in my push, I'd explore new ways to put them out in the world instead of like obsessing about these job applications and I noticed how good I felt in my body because movement was woven into everything that I did. I found myself laughing and sleeping and experimenting every single day. I was present in my life for the first time. Now, at the time, I thought I was just kind of playing around with new tools, but what I was really doing was building the skills it takes to be present in my life. Being present today doesn't just happen, not with the way that we were raised. We have to learn not only how to do it, but what it feels like in our bodies. And it's possible by doing what I was doing, which is what's called a continuous cycle of improvement. Reflect, visualize, practice. When we reflect with these guided prompts, it interrupts our brain's natural tendency to focus on the negative, and instead we're building Evidence and data of what's working that builds confidence and knowledge so that we can know better and do better going forward. And then we take all that and start visualizing into our future, which is another way of saying dreaming into the possibilities. You know, visualizing is so great because you feel in your body what a best case scenario could be. And when you use these categories, hustle, play, push, move, you flush out those feelings and get really specific about it. From there, it's nearly impossible not to practice new behaviors, new habits, and even practice gratitude to be in this life at all. The result is a continuous cycle of improvement that teaches you how to be present in your life and it serves as a counter system to the one that made us so sick. You know, it's been seven years since I had that big burnout moment and every single week I've been in this cycle building the skills to not only become but stay well. And what that means for all of us is different, but for me, it means not only a life free from burnout, but a life where I have learned to trust that the very best outcomes are both unpredictable and inevitable when I keep my grip loose. And I've seen some amazing outcomes, you know. I've seen, I have started businesses and I gave up alcohol, and I'm even on this stage with you right now. And none of that was possible, all of that was possible because I learned how to play and sleep and experiment every day. Not because I was, you know, clinging to some kind of goal that has allowed me to move from, you know, trying to be healthy to please my mom to being in relationship with her and in tune with the way that her wisdom now blends with mine. Some years ago, I started putting all of this into a notebook and a playful guidebook for folks to use, and it was available starting January 2020. And as we locked down and, you know, our worlds became smaller and we were clinging to what we knew, there were hundreds of us who just came together and released the grip instead. 
we started talking about what we were proud of, what we were learning, and started to visualize our lives in this new reality. And I watched as folks just found their wellness in their art and in their families and in a million different ways unique to them. Turns out I wasn't the only one in need of recovery. And that all of this is more fun when we're doing it together. And the irony of it all is it may lead us back to meditating every day or juice cleansing or anything else that the wellness industry offers. But when our presence leads us there, that's how we're skill building to sustain wellness and not just getting wrapped up in some industry. So when I go back to my original question, what does it mean to be well? I answer it this way. Being well is not a goal or a destination. It's just an ongoing practice of being present in our lives. Only from a place of presence can we both tend to our needs and resist the system that will pull us back to burnout every time. You know, it's not easy, but it is simple. Reflect, visualize, practice every week, and watch your presence grow every day. Thank you.